Hello, as chair of this uh, roundtable, it's my pleasure to welcome you again. And uh, uh, thank you for your presence at this roundtable on energy and climate transition in Europe. We'll be discussing mostly the challenge of implementation. Uh, I will introduce first the panelists. And for this introduction, I will follow the logic from Portugal to Europe. And then I'll introduce the organization of the roundtable. And for the roundtable, I will follow the logic from Europe to Portugal, all right? So starting with the panelists, Nuno Lacasta, the first here. <laughs> he, Nuno has been working on environmental and sustainable development for over 20, 20 years in Europe and the United States. Nuno has been in public service since 2003. He led the International Department of the Portuguese Environment Ministry. He coordinated Portugal's climate policy and directed the Portuguese Carbon Fund. And now, and since 2012, he is serving as CEO of the Portuguese Environment, Environment Agency, APA. In this capacity in, at, at, at the APA, he served as Bureau Member of the European Environment Agency, among other important uh, assignments. Then we have, not in the, in the order they are seated, but then we have Francis, Francisco Ferreira, who is President of ZERU, Sustainable Terrestrial System Association, a non-governmental environment organization with activity in Portugal. Francisco is also a professor at NOVA, School of Science and Technology, and a researcher at the Center for Environmental and Sustainability Research. Before, Francisco was president and vice president of Puercos, and he was a member of the National Water Council and of the National Council for Environment and Sustainable Development. Okay, you know why I need a, a paper for this, right? <laughs> I couldn't remember everything. Uh, okay, now Claire. Hi, Claire. Claire is a research professor of European governments, governance of sustainability transformations. I'm not close enough. But, yeah. At Ghent University. Her research focus, focuses on the policy, politics, and governance of the climate neutrality and sustainability transitions in Europe. Claire is chair of the Scientific Committee of the European Environment Agency and member of the Climate Policy Observatory of Luxembourg. Right? And finally, Max here, the executive manager of the Heidelberg Center for the Environment at, at the Heidelberg University and, this, and the CEO of Memento Novum, a strategy consultancy for sustainable development. Max holds a PhD in political science and teaches at Heidelberg University, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, the Steinbeis by School of International Business and Entrepreneurship and the German Federal Foreign Office, right? A few words about myself. I am the chair. I am a professor of social and, and a researcher here at ISCTE, a professor of social and environmental psychology. My research has been mostly looking at how people make sense of laws, uh, new laws and policies. So uh, I look mostly at the how the laws that we change then change us back at this dynamic. Uh, now that I introduced the panelists, I will introduce the logic of this roundtable. In order to keep it as a proper roundtable, the initial interventions will be short, about seven to eight minutes each of them. And because uh, this roundtable has its as its center the goal of debating the EU-Portugal dynamics regarding implementation of the Green Deal, it will be organized to be first focused at the, UL, at the EU level and then at the Portuguese level. So first, Claire Dupont will speak, will give us an overview of recent climate policy measures of the European Green Deal. Then Max Jungmann will uh, tell us about the implementation of the European Green Deal at the European level. He will give us examples 
of interdependencies between the private and the public, se public sector. Then Nuno Lacasta will talk about the implementation of the European Green Deal in Portugal, opportunities and challenges, offering a perspective from the state. And finally, Francisco will also talk about the implementation of the European Green Deal in Portugal, also about opportunities and challenges here, but an, uh, offering an NGO perspective. The, these presentations are to be then followed by a debate about, uh, among the panelists for about 20 minutes. And after this, we open the debate to the audience, both, both the in-person and the online audience. And for those of you who are online, uh, I'm uh, uh, letting you know that we will uh, accept written interventions that we can read uh, and pose to the to the room. Okay, so, and finally, if we have time, I will do a very brief wrapping up. We have now a finished intervention and I'm giving the word, the floor to Claire. Thank you. I hope I'm close enough to the microphone. Um, so um, my job this morning is to give an overview of the latest developments of um, climate and energy and also environmental policies under the European Green Deal. But I think actually a lot of the basics and the introductory information was given very well and very well done in Miranda's discussion this morning. So that, that uh, relieves me of some duty. But I think there's a few points that I want to highlight when it comes to implementation. Um, first is the European Green Deal is much more than climate policy. And uh, Miranda showed that really very well this morning in her intervention. Um, and I think we sometimes focus a lot on the climate neutrality and climate aspects of it. And we have a good history of developing climate policies in the EU. Um, and that's moving forward. So we have the Fit for 55 package, which is pretty much agreed and adopted, um, which includes policy measures um, on renewable energy, on energy efficiency, on the emissions trading system, and also new aspects, including a new emissions trading system for buildings and mobility, and then a social climate fund attached to that to help support vulnerable individuals and households and communities that may come under that ETS in the future. Um, and also um, carbon border adjustment mechanism as an external measure to try and deal with the emissions of products that are entering our market, so at the border, which is also an interesting development in the question that Miranda raised earlier about moving to more protectionist trade policies and what does that mean for the WTO? And I think that is indeed a very good question to which I do not have an answer, but a very good question to raise. Um, so the, the Fit for 55 package is really about achieving the climate goal for 2030 of reducing our emissions by 55% compared to 1990 levels. Um, and that whole package, um, it had its political negotiations that were challenging, but on the whole, it moved through the negotiations process fairly smoothly. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of other policy initiatives that come under the European Green Deal. Miranda really showed some of the industrial policies this morning. Um, we also have policies on uh, circular economy, plans to do with um, moving to low waste, waste management. I know Nuna will speak about some of those in a while. Um, but we, we also have a whole series of policies to do with nature. Um, and I'm going to maybe focus a little bit on these because this is where we have very hot topic recent developments. So when it comes to nature, we're talking also about biodiversity. Historically, the European Union has not really been great when it comes to adopting and implementing policies on biodiversity. We have a historical policy framework around birds and habitats. Um, these kind of protective measures, which were adopted in the 70s and the 90s and have been quite successful and have laid the ground for certain conservation measures. But then we had a biodiversity plan where the plan was to halt biodiversity loss by 2010, a target that we set and did not achieve. And then the plan was, OK, now we'll halt biodiversity loss by 2020. So you just move the target 
20, uh, 10 years down the line. Um, and we see under the European Green Deal, more serious efforts to connect nature issues to the underlying goals of climate neutrality and sustainability. But these are very contested. And this is one of the issues that Sebastian also mentioned that policy is contested. So in case you are have not been following the, the news this morning because you've been so concentrating on our on our um, our conference, which I support, um, you may not know that the Environment Committee in the Parliament failed to pass the nature restoration law. So it had a, a deadlock vote of 44 in favor and 44 against. So now this nature restoration law will be going to the European Parliament plenary with no support from any of the committees that have been negotiating on it. So we have a very strange situation where the European Parliament as often in our academic work also uh, highlighted as a kind of a, an environmental champion among the European institutions as in fact blocking one of the most um, important, I think, and really systematically, um, maybe even radical uh, shifts in focus towards nature and nature restoration, as opposed to just halting the damage, we're going to restore the damage that we've caused, that this has now not been pushed and not been supported by the European Parliament. Whereas member states have adopted what we call a general approach, a, a, a basis for negotiation on that file. So nature restoration has become an area of contestation under the European Green Deal. We have a, a, a soil proposal coming up, which used to be called the soil health law and now I think they've dropped the health which seemed to be like a contested term and now it will be just the soil law and um, that's also going to be a, an area of contestation and we have a marine action plan that is also a source of contestation and the marine action plan I think if you if you if you read it a little bit like the nature restoration, or if you read it, there's nothing particularly controversial about what it's proposing to do because it's all quite scientifically robust and understanding of how our nature interacts with our society and economy and how we need to protect it to be able to continue towards sustainability. The Marine Action Plan, for example, is about banning, um, oh, the phrase has, has left me now, the, the trawling on the seabed floor in areas of marine reserves so sites that are already under conservation that now we're going to ban this uh, seabed trawling i can't remember the phrase for yes it's on the tip of my tongue but i think you know what i mean um, and this is also being contested as if we ban this type of fishing in these reserves we're we're attacking our coastal communities so we see an area of the European Green Deal policy development, and you, you should also know that the European Green Deal policy measures, there is like about 150 policy measures and strategies and policy strategies that are under the European Green Deal. So it's a, it's a lot of policy negotiations as well. But we see the contestation really heavily falling on nature aspects, conservation aspects, restoration aspects, soil, marine conservation, uh, nature restoration, all of these areas that are really fundamental ecosystem services that we need in society and in our economy to move to sustainability. Um, so there, there's a lot of pushback and contestation here. And I want to kind of lay a few ideas on the table as kind of my closing reflections on why that might be the case. And I, I would like this to also be in conversation with those of you online and in the room to see if you also see things in this way or have alternative options. Um, so I had two ideas before starting this conference and then this morning I got a third, thanks to Miranda. But the two ideas that I had about it were the mismatch in policy history when it comes to climate versus nature policy. Um, and that we have developed in the EU and internationally a very strong and robust base of policy action on climate change, on moving to climate neutrality and reducing emissions that makes it very hard to contest policies there now. There's, it's very difficult for a political actor or party to 
really have strong basis for rejecting climate policy measures um, because we've been working on it for so many years. So I think there's this kind of historical ratcheting up has really helped to make sure that climate policies, although they're still contested on the details, generally they pass through um, with more or less contestation. And the, the second, so, and we don't have the same in, in nature and in biodiversity. I think this is this is the this historical building up, this is historical foundation and base for action does not necessarily exist to the same extent in our in our more sustainability biodiversity aspects. And then I was thinking that there's something about this idea of a just transition that we need to rethink in the European Union. Um, so the just transition as a pillar of the European Green Deal was really conceptualized in the EU as helping fossil fuel regions, communities and economies transition out of the fossil economy. And there's a, there's a big financial package to help those communities do that. We don't really have the same understanding of just transition for those parts of sectors of our economy that will have to respond on the ecosystem and nature and biodiversity aspects. We're not dealing with our farmers and our fishery communities in the same way. So why are we not doing that? Is that, um, is that just because the European Union is too far? It doesn't have the capacity? Is this something that we cannot resolve with money, which is how the EU has been dealing with the fossil communities? We just we send the money and, and they work towards their transition. So I, I have questions about that. Um, if you look in the EU's adaptation strategy, they talk about just resilience. And, and maybe that is the basis of a broader discussion on how we move justly with these communities who are highly affected by nature restoration aspects and biodiversity aspects and, and really work more closely with them in the just transition aspects. And then the third point that I was really inspired by Miranda on this was I think it's true what Miranda was saying, that there's a sense of global competition around this transition to a, a green industrial um, economy or a, a green energy sector. Now, I don't know if we have the same global competition when it comes to nature. So there's no external pressure to help us move in this direction. And of course, all of this takes place in the context of this populist moment, this turbulent moment, um, where we could maybe raise questions about what is really the strategy of some of these political parties and political groups to really reject nature restoration, to reject the idea of biodiversity and ecosystems um, restoration and care for our, our sustainability. Um, so I think we have a lot as lawyers, political scientists, sociologists, geographers, we have a lot of questions that we need to be investigating to try and understand the mechanisms behind the contestation that's now really very vocal against a, a key pillar of the European Green Deal, which is the nature aspects. I, I will leave it there and I hope that some of the conversations later can shed more light on these questions. Thank you, Claire. And now the floor to Max. Thank you very much. Yes, as the title suggests, I will bring a combination of my academic work at Heidelberg University and my practical work in the private sector and try to connect that to the talks that we had in the beginning. And uh, we all have learned that we have very ambitious goals set at the European level as part of the Green Deal, the Fit for 55 program, we have policy instruments. If we look at the international level, we have the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, we have the Paris Agreement, we heard about the Kyoto Protocol earlier today, and we had, we have very ambitious goals. And if we look at the implementation of those goals, what are we doing to actually achieve them? We see that there's a great gap between ambition and action. And if we analyze how these goals can be achieved, I think at least two aspects become relevant very quickly. And one is, and we heard that in the uh, lecture this morning, 
the largest share of those emission reduction needs to happen in the private sector because that's where most of the emissions actually take place at the moment and we need an exponential sustainable and in parts even regenerative development as Sebastian Overture demonstrated this morning to achieve these ambitious goals. And if we look at the current developments, the emission pathways, for example, things don't look very well, and we're definitely not on track to achieving the SDGs. We're not on track to achieving the Paris Agreement. In the European Union, there has been some progress, as we saw this morning, in terms of renewable energy production. But overall, we're really running out of time. But in contrary to just looking at those gloomy projections, I want to highlight three major developments where I see great potential to um, lead development in, in the other direction and how the private and the public sector interconnect to really unleash this potential of sustainable development in the private sector and how this is connected to the public sector. And those three areas are one, awareness and capacity building. The second one is uh, concerning finance and the third one, supply chains. So if we look at awareness and capacity building, we see a major change also in the business world in, in recent years. We see that what used to be discussed under corporate social responsibility or CSR is now being discussed and moved to sustainability, sustainability departments or ESG, environmental social governance departments. Much more awareness is there, not only to deal with sustainability as a side project, we're also doing something on CSR, but it becomes more and more relevant for the core business strategy. So how sustain the role that sustainability plays for the business strategy and the organization and culture is shifting. And we're also seeing more and more awareness of how important this is for the future success of an organization. And this is a combination of um, regulation that we're seeing, and I'll address some of that later on, but we're also seeing major changes within the business sector itself. It becomes a competitive advantage to really integrate sustainability into business models. And we see, of course, a lot of societal demand. If we think about movements like Fridays for Future and, and others that put pressure on the public and the private sector. Yet there's still a huge gap and it really requires a mindset shift, not only more transparency and there we can look at one of the first policy instruments as part of the Green Deal that is directly affects businesses, which is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive or CSRD that you all probably have heard of and that is really getting a lot of attention in the private sector these days. Um, I work with lots of businesses in Germany and even small and medium sized enterprises are now getting more and more cautious. What do we actually have to report on and are following these standards? The European, uh, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, ESRS, very closely to see what is material for us and what do we have to report and how do we have to report on it because it requires a lot of knowledge and data to actually meet those those standards and the idea is that more transparency more awareness for the topic ultimately leads to more access to also um, the public sector and um, NGOs for example to look at the sustainability reports and point out what businesses can do better. The reporting in itself does not lead to more action, but it leads to more transparency. And the idea is that that will uh, create a, a push in the in the private sector as well. And that that is one of the reasons why I'm I'm more hopeful because we see that there's a major shift in which role sustainability plays for businesses. And the second one that is where it gets really interesting because there really addresses business models. We're seeing a major shift in terms of sustainable finance. We are seeing that regulation or, or policy instrument, instruments like the EU taxonomy or in parts also then the CSRD lead to clearer standards in terms of reporting, also non-financial reporting and not just for big corporations. And we see that in, in our work with banks, for example, sustainability criteria become more and more important for decisions on who gets access to capital. 
So in theory, if only those that meet strong sustainability criteria have access to capital, then investing in non-sustainable business practices doesn't really make sense from a business perspective in, in the long term. So there is a lot of potential, but we're also seeing a lot of greenwashing in terms of ESG and other criteria. So we need to be very careful, but I think it it is a potential big lever that could be used, and we're seeing major developments in this field. And the third one is the topic of supply chains, because if in theory we only procure from suppliers that meet strong sustainability criteria, then, then those suppliers, even if they don't fall under the CSRD or other regulation, even national regulation, they have to deal with the topic and they have to at least give us some data on their uh, sustainability criteria because otherwise they will get downgraded. If you don't even give us any information on how you're performing, then the person or the organization that procures from those suppliers will have to downgrade them in their own risk management. We are seeing this actually with the German Supply Chain Act right now that mostly goes into human rights and labor law. There are some environmental aspects in there, but with the current negotiations on the CSDDD, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, there could potentially be more environmental and climate aspects in the supply chain law on the European level. And if this uh, actually triggers more and more suppliers across the supply chain, then that could have a potential ripple effect. So I completely agree that we are facing very gloomy times if we look at the global perspective, but I think there are also major developments in the interconnection between the public and the private sector that could lead development the other way very quickly. Now, the question is, will we unleash that potential or will it just be on paper? And I look forward to discussing that with you later on. Thank you very much, Max. Very perfect time management. <laughs> and now the floor to Nimula Gashton. Well, thanks very much for the invite. Um, just a, a, a thank you note before time starts counting to obviously the uh, those that organized this and invited uh, me, uh, Sebastian particularly, whom I haven't seen for many, many years, and it's a, an old friend and mentor in a way as well. Um, I'm, I'm actually torn. I was supposed to sp talk about domestic implementation. As you may imagine, I have profuse notes on that, but I feel that I would probably wish to comment and reflect upon how I see the Green Deal at this stage uh, in the context of environmental policy. Because one thing, and if that's okay, I see from the nodding in the room that uh, perhaps people uh, don't oppose that vehemently. Well, environmental policy, um, to a certain extent, in the European Union context, it's been, in my view, essentially two drives. The number one drive is it's a way for us Europeans to get a modicum of a common vision. This would never work in North America. This would never work in Australia. These countries don't plan, These like us. There's never been an environmental program in the United States. There will never be one. And this to say that this is part of our culture in a sort of way, but it's also a way of us coming together because we are so different from one another. As I think there's a second drive. It's a real politic drive for several countries, and this has been actually constant in environmental policy globally, including trade policy. For some countries, they export domestic policies in order to level the playing field. And sometimes even for Germany, in Germany's case, in order to import these policies back home. Perhaps sometimes it's tough to, you know, uh, to manage the lander. And the, a very efficient way is to first turn the policy into a European policy and then that back into domestic policy. That kind of clears a whole of negotiating hurdles, all other things being equal. Um, I think these trends, uh, in a way, haven't changed. Um, and the Green Deal, to a certain extent, it's another manifestation of these trends, uh, perhaps modern manifestation. Within the Green Deal, there are, of course, as always, many, many reasons for it. There are intrinsic, I, I would argue, also economic reasons. It is in Europe's economic interest 
to have a new wave, and this is before the Ukraine war, of uh, reindustrialization. Because we've seen with face masks, with uh, a whole bunch of other products, that to a certain extent we've uh, uh, decimated our chemicals industry because it's been exported elsewhere. And now we're more dependent than ever on importing uh, goods and, uh, and increasingly services from other locations in a context where, ironically, we're uh, getting less dependent to a certain extent on foreign energy sources. That is, this is a bit, bit of a paradox. So th it's an intrinsic economic reason behind the Green Deal. Let us not be fooled by anything else. But there are, of course, intrinsic environmental reasons. Some of them are sociological, are demographic. Uh, uh, the public in Europe demands a different approach, approach to plastics use, to single-use plastics, demands a different approach even towards uh, our relationship with, with nature. I'll get to that very quickly in a minute. So there is public support for that, but there's the counter argument to this, which was of course the gilets jaunes and the just transition debate. You had to package that into, again, a narrative that was persuasive, that had a little bit for everybody. Uh, that's how policy gets done anyway. It's, you know, you know that I think Bismarck said that uh, you never know what comes out of a law. I, I quoted this recently at the EEA. Um, you know, you see the law, but you, you don't want to ask what comes into that law because it's like sausage. And I kind of understand that. One appreciates that, but one doesn't want to know what comes into that. Um, so how do how do I see uh, uh, the developments of the Green Deal uh, if in a couple of minutes still? Climate policy and energy, okay, by and large. The Fit for 55 is a in very interesting uh, development. You mentioned, Claire, um, um, buildings and trading. Let's see how that works in real life, but it's fascinating to see to, to try to see that through. Um, circularity, also okay. Batteries, the so-called, I forget now the name, the, the sort of pass, the, 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 uh, the European uh, circularity uh, uh, identity card, whatever it's called. That's very interesting. I'm not sure. Well, let's see how it works in a global trading system uh, of sorts although it's regionalizing and Europe has a tradition, that's a good uh, element of Europe itself exporting standards to the world, cafe standards and uh, automobile, that's likely to continue. It's also cheaper for many other countries. They don't have to go through that ordeal of negotiating all of that. But now, of course, the car industry has changed dramatically. The European car industry has sort of fallen behind the Koreans, even the Chinese, certainly the Japanese and, and the North Americans in terms of electric vehicles. That's why we've had all those difficulties with car emissions. Um, green claims is an interesting uh, development. Greenwashing is always there. And so to organize that, also picking up the uh, uh, taxonomy, the sustainable financing uh, drive, which clearly the European Union has led. Um, wastewater treatment as part of the so-called zero pollution uh, uh, euphemism, everything in it, and nobody knows what it's in it. But nonetheless, the the wastewater treatment drive is interesting for another generation. It, it needs to be properly assessed in terms of cost benefit that everybody's so much different. Um, there is a sort of a running theory in Europe that it's also some technologies which were ready off the shelf before the, before the pandemic and some companies in some countries want now to push it very strongly to export. That's not news, I, incidentally, that's the way it's always been. Um, natural, uh, nature and soils. The soils debate actually has 15 years old. I remember back in our 2007 EU presidency, we tried in the informal European Council to have a soils debate. At the time, Germany just said, no way. This time around, Germany seems to say, okay. But then again, it's a German MEP that's blocking this out of the European Parliament, generally speaking. So, you know, uh, next next chapters to see that how this go this is going, and I'll get to the European makeup Parliament makeup in thirty seconds. But the debate is not surprising. It's tough for Europeans to look at nature in a sense that we've decimated, we've reduced to fifty percent our wetlands. 
many countries except Poland and some fringes of South Southern Europe have no nature. I mean, they have nature, but it's not the nature they would seek to have. And so as a result, we're going through a psychological, you know, ontological process of trying to figure out what kind of a nature we want. But again, on nature as well, this comes back perhaps to your proposal on just transition, if the analogy is possible. One thing which is not happening, it's very difficult to see happen, that we could have in other areas is that if you want to restore uh, areas, you pay first, oh, my time is up, you pay first, and then you assess the nitty gritty detail of some restoration metrics. Because if you're gonna go through the classical metrics for classical uh, economic valuation, you're not gonna have any protection. It just doesn't work, everybody knows that. So that's a challenge for sure. I think uh, adaptation, uh, climate adaptation is way behind. We get all excited by mitigation. We forget the big, big, big bill coming up for all of us. That means urban renewal, landscaping in a different fashion. Let's link these issues together. And if we do, perhaps we'll have more hopes for including nature. Uh, I'm wondering whether we also have, as part of the energy debate and installing solar panels and stuff like that, where, whether we'll, we're bound for... Uh, and this is a rhetorical question, um, whether we're bound for another wave of deregulation. We've had a few over the last uh, 20, 30 years. So that's a debate. And finally, European uh, Parliament elections. Uh, as always, they will uh, somewhat influence uh, the, the next generation of uh, European Union policies. It is no coincidence that a lot of people are saying, oh, we need to make sure that the Green Deal stays there. We need, and that's a really weird proposition, because is there a chance that the Green Deal may, in fact, be derailed and pushed aside as a result of the Ukraine war and energy security, say? So we need to be attentive to that. And being attentive to that means also that we need to look at the relationship between, of course, the European uh, uh, Parliament elections and the actual makeup of the, of the Council. Friends, I would argue that will be the next debate if 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 france's political winds change because la france est incontournable thanks very much thank you nunu and good morning everyone uh it's a pleasure to be with you and uh to have this uh, opportunity um, I will also talk a little bit about the European perspective from the NGO side, but at the same time, I will try to focus on the last two, three minutes about Portugal. And the reason for this is that Zero is a member of the European Environmental Bureau, uh, Climate Action Network Europe, uh, Zero Waste Europe, uh, Transport and Environment. So we're members, active members of a lot of organizations working at European level. And, and the first thing that I'd like to tell you is that from the NGO side, uh, the Green Deal is, um, as, as uh, the, 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 the president of the commission actually said, is like our, um, our uh, moonshot is, is, is really, you know, the, 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 the most impressive and uh, integrated vision of sustainability that, that came up in, um, in December 2019. So uh, it's, it, it was really a revolution. Uh, in terms of how to conceptualize the different areas of uh, of the environment and uh, and not only environment but economy and and the, and the social components, uh, even governance. So definitely uh, that 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 is that is the point. And uh, jumping for a, an instant into the future, um, one of the real issues that we are dis discussing now is can we have a continuation of the Green Deal? Uh, can we have a Green Deal too? Uh, and, uh, and as we can see, and looking at the polls on the, on the European uh, parliamentarian elections, that is going to be quite, quite difficult. Look, uh, and, uh, and you can see how things are changing recently with the nat nature restoration law and other uh, issues both at the national level and at the european level that may uh, cause a completely different policy within the next uh, in, in within the next years uh, from the european side now let's look at the green deal uh, is it is it um, ambitious yes 
is it enough? It's not enough. And that should be clear. When we say 5455, let's see that, you know, that is not coherent with the Paris Agreement. 55% by 2030 of reduction of emissions from 1990 to 2030 is not the pathway for um, necessary for Europe. Uh, we would like to have 65% and climate neutrality by 2040. Um, the, 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 the European Union is uh, indeed always at the front side in, in terms of uh, climate uh, policy, but, um, but now, you know, we have lower emissions, we have, we, we're less strong in terms of the, the, the UN uh, negotiations, but, but the point is that in, we have a responsibility, we have a, a historical responsibility to actually get uh, uh, to carbon neutrality before that time, such that the other blocks or the other countries throughout the world can actually have a later date uh, in order to, for us to achieve a, a global climate neutrality as soon as possible. Uh, then, um, so on the climate side, we're good and we're bad. On, on the zero pollution side, let's look at air pollution. You know, the, the World Health Organization just gave us new guidelines uh, almost two years ago on air pollution. Is, um, is the, 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 the air quality directive that is currently uh, under voting in the parliament, uh, is it accomplishing that zero pollution target from the WHO? No, it is not. Uh, so again, we're, we're pushing to better uh, targets, but those targets are not enough with in, in terms of consistency with what should be made. Circular economy, oh, that's great. But we're mostly focusing on recycling. We're not focusing enough, enough on the eco design, on the reduction and the reuse. So again, you know, there, there, there's a lot of uh, missed policies in, in, in what is becoming the implementation of, of the Green Deal. And, uh, and we can could talk also on biodiversity and, and other areas. What are the main principles that we believe should be implemented at the European level for us to uh, 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 provide not only a, 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 a safer climate, but also all these aspects being integrated? The first one is one word, sufficiency. We are uh, wasting a lot. Uh, from food to packaging to uh, energy, uh, we need this word in terms of our first priority. The second is efficiency. And, uh, and again, you know, sufficiency is like, we, uh, uh, you know, we, we are here with the lights on, but eventually if we turn out, uh, if, uh, if we turn down the lights, we'll still continue to be able to work. Uh, or, or if you, uh, particularly if you are in an empty room, uh, the lights on won't uh, make any sense. That's efficiency. Efficiency is to have a LED light instead of uh, a, a, an incandescent uh, light bulb. And, uh, and then renewables, that's the third word. And, uh, and, and, and renewables, not only in, in electricity, but uh, overall. Uh, and these actually are, okay, more climate-related priorities, but they are also related with the other components. Now let's talk a little bit about Portugal and as an example of what is going on. Um, you see that there's th there are uh, increasing conflicts with this strategy from, from Europe to actually implement um, more and more renewables. And we are in favor of renewables, even though our Ministry of Infrastructure says that uh, the environmentalists in Portugal are worse than the oil and gas industry because they are the ones that actually, uh, you know, do not enable the acceleration of renewables. But we, we, we really think that it's very important that we can make compatible the the you know the wind offshore onshore the solar panels uh, and and in an overall sustainability package. Uh, does it make sense for, to have a thousand hectares of solar panels in in within the landscape? Uh, probably not. Uh, and we have other alternatives. Does it make sense to produce hydrogen to put it in the natural gas pipeline? 
uh, to make it viable, uh, particularly because you know the German government asked us uh, to provide hydrogen from Portugal and Spain uh, through uh, Barcelona and Marseille to send it out, losing a lot of efficiency uh, for 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 Germany. Of course, it doesn't make sense. So there are some political priorities in Portugal and other countries that are you know uh, generating more and more conflicts between between people and the need for renewables and the need for decarbonization. And are we in, on the right track? Unfortunately, we're not. We were supposed in Portugal to have our emissions uh, uh, um, in, in, in a trend of 4% reduction per year to reach our targets. And what is happening is that after COVID, wow, we, we, the, the top 10 industries that we have, including our uh, uh, aviation uh, company, it increased 18% from 2021 to 2022. So transport is becoming a, a really, um, you know, uh, pain, but not only, also the industry. So to, to finish up, because, you know, time is out, uh, is running, uh, running out, what, what I think we can debate is, is really, you know, the coherence. Can we decide not on the political moods that then you know the Portuguese government and other governments are following, but you know have a, a little bit more vision of what makes sense without just the opportunity to use the money from Repower You or from other financial programs. Uh, you know, by the way, um, if you want to go to Madrid. You, you you probably take a plane because we don't have any direct train either by night or day to connect these two capitals. You spend 12 hours uh, with two connections. It's much more expensive. And, you know, this is the real thing. It's not, it's when, 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 when you actually touch upon the the, the 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 problems that we have and uh and 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 really we 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 have a huge uh number of challenges we have a huge number of opportunities fortunately i think portugal has the right vision in some areas including decarbonization then you know it falls apart with some stupid ideas that uh that we still have to to uh uh, overcome, but uh, the NGOs are here for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. The the time management was perfect. We have a lot of time for debate. I can um, briefly give my perspective and then pass on the next question to Francisco um, and the NGO perspective there, because I think you addressed a very prominent issue with the train versus um, air issue. So um, how are we going to get from, from knowledge to action, basically, or from all of the goals and ambition to implementation? And I think for that, it requires um, an understanding, as we discussed earlier, from of the, of the role that different actors can play. So we have the EU level, and then in terms of regulation, we also have the national level, but we also increasingly have the involvement of the local level we see that cities get more and more involved we see city networks um developing and the interdependencies between the different governance levels but also within uh society between the private sector and societal groups like ngos can lead to on the one hand fostering implementation for example, we see that sometimes there's a bit of scapegoating the EU, or there's so much regulation coming on. And there's also the CSRD, and now we have to report on all of this and we don't even understand what it all means. But on the other hand, that's also, that comes in quite handy because if that all of that regulation would come from the national level, and we heard earlier, we on the way we have to develop and continue to have a European identity, 
if we have that on the national level, we see how how fragile that is and how political majorities can change over time. So that's actually really useful. The EU is often criticized, but if the EU weren't there, it would be very hard to streamline that legislation and to implement it. And that, again, influences the private sector, it influences NGOs, and we see how they influence each other. That's just a very quick response to that. But I would like to focus on the implementation issue that was raised before, because I'd be very interested in learning uh, what could be the EU's role in that regard? If we see there's a very specific issue in terms of infrastructure, we see that emissions in terms of um, airborne emissions are way too high and they're projected to increase, but the infrastructure isn't there. So just demanding consumers to change their behavior is not a feasible and a socially viable option. Which role can the EU play in that regard? Okay, maybe I can touch upon some of the issues. One, I, I, I think you really um, touched one, one of the most important things, which is, you know, the different uh, roles at the different levels of governance. Um, uh, but, but first of all, I think that, I, I don't know if someone talked about that directly, but I think that the Green Deal was and still is one of the most complex and challenged challenging uh, uh, environment to, 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 to actually uh, pass from the European level to the national level. You know, what I want to say is that the amount of laws, of directives, regulations that went through since 2019 until now, is, you know, maybe it's okay for certain countries that have the staff to lead, you know, to, to, to actually look at them and uh, look at the details, but Nunu can talk about it probably. It's, I, I felt quite difficult from the NGOs and from some governance to follow hundreds and hundreds of pages of regulation, you know, going throughout the, all the different fields and actually to make sometimes the connection between them. It was a huge challenge. We, we, we're still now debating, you know, air quality and res the restoration law. It, it passed four years since, since the European Green, Green Deal came out uh, as, as the main concept and idea and, the, and proposal. So um, it has been really hard. Now, what I think is that we really need to have that coherence and those goals and that politic and that political will, we we really need uh, people to get engaged, to change their behaviors. But there has to be leadership at the national, okay, at the European, but also at the national and local level. And what I see is that the local level, for instance, is key. And and uh, you know, in Lisbon, what I see is that we have problems with air pollution with, with uh, NO2 in particularly coming from the diesel cars. And, and Zero is pushing for, you know, taking out the, the, the road traffic out of the center of Lisbon. You know, it has been years and you go to the center of Lisbon and you have, you know, uh, uh, cars and cars and cars and it's impossible to, to block, but, but Lisbon, Porto and another city, Guimarães, we have this goal within the, the we are one of, the, these three are one of the 100 cities that have to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. So the local level here is really, really critical, but I think that companies are also crucial because, and that was the reason I, I, I touched upon the road traffic, because you go to the companies and 80% of the cars that enter Lisbon they are company cars. You know, those companies pay for, for the gas and the diesel and the, and the cars and provide parking. And, and then they do the nice corporate reporting, as you're telling, saying that everything is monitored. And eventually, you know, they, they even have a science-based target where they become neutral uh, within a, a couple of years. So there is a key responsibility of, of the local level and companies to actually do the implementation, of course, with you know our own role as a uh, role as citizens. A you couple would of like notes. To, yeah. One on the implementation gap. Once again, it's a classic of European policymaking. Uh, without 
with few exceptions, most European policies on environment, perhaps the first generation uh, uh, water quality directives, uh, and I'm sure about waste, have sort of reached the targets on time. Ever since, it's never happened. That's not to say we shouldn't be ambitious in proposing targets. The Water Framework Directive's targets have been not quite yet delayed, but believe you me, they will be delayed or you'll find another way because people in a way cannot reconcile those lofty targets with the fact that they're spending gazillions of euros and then water quality is still deficient given the way it's sort of framed. So there are some, uh, it's okay that we have this, that, that debate between where we should be and what we can actually achieve because that what gives us arguably the wherewithal to then put in place trans-European networks uh, funding. Um, and of course, the implementation is at the domestic level. And of course, we're all so different and we're having different trends in different countries going forward. I, I would like to underline um, Francisco's point on air quality with a European figure and then a national figure. It's estimated per year that 300,000 people in Europe die prematurely out of uh, air quality issues, uh, respiratory diseases. That's estimated to be around 6,000 in this country. That's a pandemic a year. And yet somehow uh, we're not able to uh, pass that information in, in, a, in a practical way for uh, our, the public. And yet even more, I would argue, troubling is that to fix that problem, you only need one measure which is the holy grail of any policymaker. One measure, clearly a lot of actors, but one measure to phase out combustion engines in cities. That would fix it forever, air quality in cities. And yet we keep on, it's a, a, an issue of willingness to policy, to, to, to write policy and of course to pay. But it's not disconnected from what I mentioned earlier, from the fact that the European car industry has left behind, has lagged behind. These things are connected. Thank you. And uh, I also have a question. It is um, maybe to Claire, because she mentioned it first, but uh, of course to everybody. It regards nature restoration, because um, this seems to be, for, it, it will take us also to the importance of the local level. Nature restoration as Natura 2000 already, uh, was a policy, are policies that cannot uh, happen without uh, the local level. Their main impacts are at local level. And because Natura 2000 have been, has been in place for uh, so many years, we now have good literature showing that the contestation has been uh, the local contestation of the Natura laws, of the, natu the Natura network laws has been on lack of local involvement, local voice has been uh, on the lack of uh, making farmers and fishers partners, not just in the implementation, but also in the design of the of the policies. And my my question is: Is are we going to see the same? My my own work has been mostly in the last years interviewing farmers and fishers about natural law. So uh, this is what I also hear in Portugal uh, very clearly. So I wonder if this new law is uh, also going to reproduce the same dynamics of lack of involvement of the local level. This is one question, and the, the second question about the same topic is. Um, about an expression Claire also used, the expression of ecosystem services. And uh, I wonder how important and how prominent is this concept still in this policy? And in fact, I would like to hear you about how uh, useful and adequate do you think this notion is to uh, conceptualize people-nature relationships? Okay, because this is a contested concept, of course, and it's it, it's interesting to go back to this discussion, I think. Thank you, Paula, um, for your questions. Um, when it comes to local contestation, I mean, we have local contestation across many policies. 
um, because of course the implementation happens at national and local level. We have local contestation on renewable energy policies, on uh, transport policies, on all sorts of things. Um, I, so I think it's a, it's a general issue of implementation of EU policies in a context, and Nuno and Francisco, I think we're both very good at highlighting the, the differences among member states, but also the differences among national and local levels and the different actors, as Max was mentioning, that are involved in it. And I think the EU traditionally does not have a good um, connection to citizens, any citizens, farmers, fishers, whoever. Um, and this is, this is, um, I think we would call this like a, a representation gap, probably in uh, more political science terms, this idea that the, the the chain of representation towards the EU level requires kind of a sense of trust that the policymakers at the highest level have the interests of those at the lowest level or the communities at heart. Um, and I, there maybe is more recently a higher breakdown of that trust. So more recently, I talk about, say, since the end of the 2000s with the financial and eco economic crisis, a general breakdown of this trust that policymakers at higher levels have the public good interests at heart. Um, and so I think that the contestation is, is, is probably justified, in fact, in many cases. Um, and that's why we need to have more of these um, participatory processes, we need to have more of those discussions happening, we need to really conceptualize the just transition and just tra resilience with communities, not as a financial transfer, but as a as a, a shift in how we in, envision our societies. And indeed, those voices are traditionally not the most uh, central in the discussions, which I think is 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 a shame. Um, but there are people in the audience who have far better knowledge of participative and democratic processes and societal discussions than I, So, and probably you do too. Uh, so there, I, I don't think I have mu much more that I can offer. Uh, ecosystem services, I don't even remember saying it, but I believe you. Um, I think ecosystem services is a very old term, but I think what we are seeing is in fact a shift away from that. I think in the policy under the European Green Deal, there's also a shift away from this idea of ecosystem services. We're talking more about foundational um, necessities for society and those foundational needs come from high quality nature. Um, and so I, I think the height of the ecosystem services idea was maybe around the 2010s. I remember a long time ago a report on the economic benefits of protecting the earthworm, you know, things like this. This was just a, this is just the way we talked about nature. You know, we talked about it in economic terms to show there is a real economic benefit to protecting it. And I, I feel like we don't necessarily need that as much anymore. But we haven't replaced it necessarily with something that's that speaks to people so much yet um, and maybe there's more of a philosoph philosophical understanding of the nature people connection that we need to tap into more um, and there I would be happy to learn more about that in fact myself. So. Of so course. I, I fully agree with Claire but the point is that if you look at the, the forest sector, for instance, or uh, or or a lot a lot of landowners, they they really would like to have something like a biodiversity market similar to the carbon market, which I think is you know extremely difficult in terms of uh, uh, quantifying the services and all the remuneration and everything. So I think we really have to have kind of a qualitative view on on what nature gives us and why we should care and what are uh, what it provides and and not go into the same idea of uh, of the, the of of a, a carbon market based on on uh, credits and compensation and all that but but really the perspective is you know that the the, the the anxiety even uh, I, I participated also in the in the in the CBD in Montreal in the in the, in the meeting of the convention on uh, um, biological diversity and and uh, you know the agreement that was achieved was kind of 
the Paris Agreement for biodiversity. Now we need, you know, a market approach for the biodiversity services. So I I I I go through your pathway, but I feel that there's a lot of people that want to go on 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 through something different. Nuno also has a comment. I think no. Well, I just want to contest this. Actually, which one of those? Both. Well, you at the latter end. I think I, I'm not really contest because I think I think we can bridge the gap, even if temporarily. Who do you think is going to pay for ecosystem services at the first stage? It's going to be carbon, because you can you can measure it. The question is whether you're able at scale, because direct. No questions asked payments, which is what I was arguing earlier. Unless you dramatically change common agriculture policy, uh, it, it ain't going to happen. So arguably, uh, we can peg along the carbon offset and nature service, which, of course, doesn't need to be that quantified because you cannot do that. I, I concede on that. But you can, because you can have other metrics. For instance, in this country, we have a very objective metric, which is forest fires, which is land degradation as a result of forest fires. It doesn't get much better than that if you if you think of how to uh, 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 change that uh, going forward. You should be careful in order not to incentivize new forest uh, just to have the carbon, uh, you know, uh, commodity uh, uh, and and the payment. And you can fix that, but to think that, you know, over time you'll have you'll you'll be able to restore soil just through public subsidies. I think I think that's a bit foolhardy. Thank you. Uh, th thank. Uh, sorry. Uh, actually, I, I would like to come later to another uh, issue, which is modern regular uh, rulemaking, which I think is also a very fundamental issue. In this maybe debate. the the audience will click on some of these issues, and so maybe we open out the debate. To the audience, thank you. There's, um, of course, a lot of very interesting uh, issues raised by uh, all the people, but I would like to follow on on um, a comment on of Paula and and, and then about uh, the the local contestation uh, and Claire. Of course, everything is contested, but I think um, things relate because I'm a labor economist. And I think um, th things and activities related with the nature have always been despised. And fishermen and agriculture and uh, peasants are precisely the people and the, the work that, that is more, more despised and uh, essential wo workers during the COVID. Um, uh, we've seen that during the COVID too. So I, I think really it's a qualitative question. Yes, it's it's a philosophical phil philosophical question. The nature uh, has always been. I mean, in our in our um, civilization since the Greek, uh, all that has to do with bodily necessity, bodily needs are despised and. What is great is rationality and calculations, and the Homo economicus is the big uh, off the ground calculator. And um, so, um, I think that this uh, physical dimension, the physical world, it just it, it just as if um, as if it is still lacking, and only when we come to the local level uh, do we meet it. And just like last last thing, the the shift project has um, has done a plan for the transformation of the the economic the French economy uh, solely in physical units, not a euro was was uh, spoken of, only in physical units, quantity of lithium and of cobalt and of soil and of uh, health soil. And um, would it, wouldn't, would it not be a good uh, idea to, to bring uh, the, the physical dimension into, uh, into things uh, in, in the way the EU uh, think about uh, the Green Deal. Thank you. Um, thank you for a very interesting panel to begin. And as an environmental economist, um, I, I think it is important that we dispel this notion that biodiversity can ever be marketed like carbon. 
it doesn't make any sense. It's not a philosophical question. The, the point about carbon being tradable is because carbon is a homogeneous product in the sense of the impact on the environment. So it doesn't matter if it's emitted in Lisbon or in Porto or in China for that matter, you can trade it because one ton of carbon is one ton of carbon in the atmosphere. And that will never be true for biodiversity because it's context specific. You can never trade biodiversity credits, period. I don't think we should go down that. That's a dead end. We should stop even talking about it. If anyone mentions it, you shut it down because it doesn't make any sense. So that's my first comment <laughs> as an economist. It's a market that has no meaning, no, no sense at all. However, I do believe that, that that does not mean that you can't do anything with economic instruments for biodiversity to support biodiversity. So as Nuno mentioned, the idea of paying uh, landowners for what they're doing positively on their land, and it goes beyond carbon sequestration, we have to go beyond carbon sequestration to include the biodiversity impact through monitoring, through indicators is a very good idea. As he also made clear, it is difficult. It's not something, you know, pay first and monitor later is not something that's easy to uh, implement in a, for a national or even European levels. However, I would argue that maybe we can begin by changing the current policies that are forcing landowners to do things that are bad for biodiversity, which we economists call the environmentally harmful subsidies, because we still have plenty of those, especially in the common agricultural policy. So we're still paying farmers to do things that we know are bad for the environment. And we do not accept, we, know, we do not give them subsidies if they do things that we know are good for the environment. So we take money away if they have a, a bunch of uh, you know, shrub, which they're not supposed to have shrub, they're supposed to have clean land. Because if they're farmers, they're supposed to be producing food. And if they're leaving shrubs there, then it's not food. So this, this is real. I'm a farmer and I have a property. And IFAP, the Portuguese uh, agricultural, who gives out the Portuguese agricultural subsidies, they have their satellites. And if they see that you have a, a patch of shrub there, they take money away from you every year. That happens every year. And imagine this at the European scale. Maybe we can just begin by not paying farmers to do things that are bad for the environment, forcing farmers economically to do things that are bad for the environment. I think that would be a very good starting point. I start again? Yeah, I get the, okay. Um, thank you um, for your comments. Um, so first, when I said it was a philosophical question, I wasn't talking about a market for, bi for biodiversity. I was talking about the connection between humans, people, and nature. I think there is our philosophical question, because um, if you look in environmental political philosophy, we did have an understanding a long time ago that nature has its own intrinsic value and our relationship to it doesn't matter because we should protect, I mean, nature should be just left alone. And then we moved to this idea of nature having inherent value, which began the relationship between humans and uh, nature as we appreciate nature, we find it beautiful, it's aesthetically pleasing. And that was the relationship. And then it moved to instrumental value. So nature gives us things. That's why we have a relationship with it. So I, we need to think philosophically differently about the way our relationship to nature has changed and how we can reassess that. So that was the philosoph philosophical question I was raising. Um, so it was really interesting to listen to two economists, um, a labor economist and a, an environmental economist coming into this discussion because I don't think there's anybody that disagrees with you, Katerina. I don't think there's anybody that disagrees. But it's the politics of the common agricultural policy at the European level that prevents that from happening. So we need to understand the politics. We need to understand the interests that are locked into our system, the power structures that are in there. And the same goes for the contestation and our, the way we have valued different aspects of our, of our economy. This is These are political decisions at the end of the day. And those are about interest representation and power structures that have built up over years, over time that become locked in. And I think there we need to have the courage and just to take a little bit the words maybe from my colleague beside me to be able to first understand and reveal and make those public, these power structures, and also have courage to contest those power structures. And that's, I think, 
we're in this moment where it can kind of go either way. And we see that in some parts, we have started to move a bit more in the right direction and other parts, those power structures remain intensely uh, holding on to what's called the status quo sometimes, but actually everything moves. So I think that's a kind of a funny way of thinking about it. You know, society changes anyway, when we talk about maintaining a status quo, but it's about maintaining a status quo of power and interests for a certain sector or a certain group or a certain powerful actor. And these are all very uh, broad abstract terms, but I hope you understand what I, what I mean. Okay, I don't, I don't disagree with just thinking that uh, these debates need to be a bit more in depth. And I'll say why. You can peg along a carbon credit, a conservation metric, uh, in a way, as a result of that, and we can even pick up the, the, the business side that we heard earlier. A lot of companies nowadays with scope three emissions, that means that they have to take care of emissions reductions, not only for themselves, but for their providers. And in effect, it means that they have to take into account emissions reductions beyond their own, say, uh, targets under the European Union um, emissions trading scheme. Um, a lot of companies are saying, we can and we should invest, not out of social responsibility only, in uh, 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 recovering uh, land, land restoration as in effect. Um, um, and if we, if we can do that, um, uh, it would be interesting for us to sort of do that beyond compliance. And I see some role for voluntary carbon markets there. In fact, as you know, we've put in place a proposed law in this country just recently that creates a voluntary carbon market and it creates so-called, what is it called, uh, carbon plus, and the plus being biodiversity. We're going to be testing it out. Um, but I think specifically for countries that have forest fires and have to change the so-called landscape mosaic, there is an opportunity there that should be seasoned or should be, at least be tested out. I was um, talking to Claire earlier, one of the problems in Europe about the so-called land use, land use and change in forestry debate, which has been going on for 20 years, is that unlike in other areas, we have not led by example. The success of European Union environmental policy and clearly climate policy is that when we when when push came to shove, we led by example. We're locked on this. Uh, I think we've moved recently, but I, th I think we should do more. In fact, we need to do more. Thank you. Uh, that, this was a very interesting discussion, and I'm I'm sorry, but now I have to move it to a totally different set of questions that are coming from the online um, audience. Uh, I'll, I'll select three because we have little time. And the first one is, is addressed to Francisco and Nuno. And the question is, is there coordination on a, or agreement between Portugal and Spain for climate policies and energy policies? So one question about Portugal-Spain coordination. Uh, a second question uh, goes to Germany. So is there, is there a better alternative to actual German renewable policy? Is it really bad? Uh, and the third question is a classic. Uh, how acute, how important do you think are the generational divisions in support for climate and nature policies? So a, a classic question for uh, environmental debates. Uh, let's start with these three and see if we have time for more. Yeah, maybe I can start with Portugal and Spain and then the last one. Um, in, in, indeed, there are some um, there are similarities, geographical uh, climate similarities between Portugal and Spain, and therefore, uh, for instance, when when you look at the renewables policy, it's it's very similar. We have an Iberian electricity market. Uh, we got an exception within the within the European market to to actually during uh, uh, the the the. the to actually regulate the the natural gas prices, so um, when when you look at the, the the goals, it's true that the Spanish have nuclear, but they are phasing out. We do not have nuclear, for instance. But but the what is what is happening in Spain happens, you know, is very similar to Portugal. 
natural protected areas, um, problems with the common agriculture policy in uh, areas of intensive agriculture, uh, you know, saying, uh, saying yes to Germany and France in a lot of issues. Uh, and, uh, and let's see actually how it will work um how what, what will come out of the spanish elections uh, soon to see how agreed we are we also have disagreements like uh, you know how come we do not have um uh, a, a fast train line between uh, lisbon and madrid but um yes th th there's a lot in common i think that in many issues portugal and spain act together within the european con uh, within the european context and um because we have similar territories we both have islands like we have the the, the azores and madeira and uh spanish uh spain has the 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 uh the baleares and the, the canary islands and 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 yes i i think there is an articulation but it could be much much better and again uh sometimes uh the coherence or or the 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 what is achieved between the governments is not on on uh, on the right side of uh uh of environment and social uh uh rights is 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 really you know because in many cases we have coincidence of the parties in power in Portugal and Spain and then we take political decisions that are not that that's great just an example again you know wasting because Europe is going to give us money we're going to build this pipeline to carry a huge amount of hydrogen from the Iberian Peninsula to actually support uh, the rest of Europe and to have that hydrogen we'll have more and more renewables and again the critical question is doesn't make sense for Spain and Portugal to prioritize using hydrogen in an as efficient and efficient way in their own countries but that is not the point. The point is that we have to satisfy the the the, the other other political uh, interests. Finish up with the nature and and uh, and uh, imp implementation of of policies. I think that the key word is planning and participation and anticipation, and that's what we don't have. Um, you know, if if I knew what type of strategy for solar uh, photovoltaic solar panels we would follow in Portugal, uh, you know, two or three years ago in terms of, uh, uh, and with the involvement of NGOs, we, we were never involved in the discussion. Only now we're going into the discussion of the, the so-called go-to areas or, uh, uh, but, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, decisions already made we were never asked to talk about it. So uh, so that's the key question. We have to anticipate, we have to discuss, we have to be transparent. And uh, in, in many cases, we actually agree. And in many cases, you know, the, the solution is not uh, yes or no, it's complex. But, but we can go through that complexity, but let's talk, let's discuss. And, and in many cases, in many countries, we do not have this uh, uh, precautionary uh, uh, politics and, and policies that could us actually save a lot of time and manage to both save nature and implement the policies that, you, that we need for climate and for other areas. That's great. Right. <laughs> Sorry. I've... Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I won't say anything then that is German. Right. Um, I have to say that I'm very biased, of course, because I'm the only German on the panel. And um, looking at German policies, I'm more critical than someone um, from the outside, probably looking at it because I'm working in fields related to uh, climate change. So I have very high expectations towards my government to um, do better. Actually, if you look at renewable energy, I think the question was particularly renewable energy uh, climate and nature policies all right we have yeah how much time do you have right now for example it's a very contested topic in terms of um how do we change um 
the way we produce and distribute heat. It's a, it's a big thing in Germany, but I will focus on renewables. <laughs> um, Germany actually was um, a leader in terms of renewable energy production many, many years ago. And then during the Merkel government fell, fell back in production for several reasons. One is um, it's quite well, our main potential for renewable energy production in Germany is offshore wind, onshore wind, and solar. There's also a bit of potential in terms of water generation, but those three are the main possibilities that we have. And we have actually a higher amount of energy production in the north because of offshore and onshore wind and the potential there. But most of the production um, you mentioned the high energy demand in Germany is in the south in Germany and how we transport energy from the north to the south is not very well managed because we lack the, the appropriate grids to, to do that. So even if we expand our renewable energy production in the north, um, we will not with the current grid be able to transport all of it to where it is needed in the south. We don't have the required storage. Uh, capabilities as well. So sometimes we actually have a very high share of renewable energy production of the overall energy mix. But then, of course, we have um, times where we don't have that and we can't store it properly at the moment. We also have the issue that we're facing out of coal and nuclear energy at the same time and trying to build up renewable energy. So then we're back at the super wicked problems that we're we were discussing earlier because we need we have we're facing these technical issues and many social issues at the same time so how to actually facilitate that just transition is a big issue in germany that germany won't be able to deal with alone we also depend on germany's neighbors in terms of the energy market for example we are already 7 minutes later uh, than we were supposed. So if no one has any uh, very pressing comment to make, I'll just uh, take one minute to wrap up. Uh, one minute to say that um, the idea was that from this, that I take from the table is that uh, it would be important for uh, European cl climate and general environmental policy to be clear on how to go to the targets, how to achieve the targets. And that would uh, imply much more consultation, participation, involvement of more diverse actors, and even some more deliberation that is open-ended, not closed in where we are going. So two minutes. And thank you very much to the panelists. Thanks for, thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you to the audience.